Good evening and welcome to tonight's Brattleboro Select Board meeting here on BCTV. This is Tim Johnson. The board tonight as liquor commissioners are being asked to approve a catering permit for the annual Soap Docks Derby scheduled for this Sunday at 101 John Sites Drive. The board on other business will be hearing the monthly financial report, receiving a copy of the financial management questionnaire by the State Auditor of Accounts. They'll be asked to approve the purchase of playground equipment for the West River Park to be paid for with donated funds. In addition, they'll hear a presentation and be asked to approve a letter of comment to the Vermont Public Service Board on a wireless telecommunication tower, which is proposed for 1277 Putney Road. In addition, the board is asked to authorize engagement of a company for energy audits at 14 separate town facilities. All that and more coming up. The Brattleboro Select Board is next here on BCTV. Thank you for watching. Good evening. It's August 18, 2015, and we're here for our second regularly scheduled monthly select board meeting. I call the meeting to order just after 6.15. I want to greet everybody who's in attendance. Uh, I want to thank staff members who are here, members of the press, and our ASL interpreters, and I also want to uh, greet and welcome everybody who's watching us on television. The first matter on tonight's agenda, oh, is the meeting been officially warned? Yes, it has. Thank you. The first item on tonight's agenda is to approve the meeting minutes from August 4th of 2015. Do we have a motion? So moved. We have a motion to approve the meeting minutes from August 4th, 2015 as presented. Are there any comments, any suggestions, any changes from anybody on the board or anybody who's in so attendance? For people who weren't there, uh, do, we, do we abstain? Do I abstain? Well, my view has always been that even if you weren't in attendance, you can vote in favor of meeting minutes as presented based upon their having been prepared by somebody mm -hmm. who no reviewed the, the <laughs> recording and given that they're approved by the other people who were there. Thank you. That's what I do anyway. Oh, yeah, I think that's what we Any do. other questions or comments or suggestions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? That carries 4-0. The next matter on the agenda is chair's remarks. Um, first, I'd like to announce that um, at its July 27, 2015 meeting, the um, Department of Housing and Community Development renewed the village center designation for West Brattleboro <laughs> Village Center. And that's a designation that will remain valid for the next five years. So that's in line with our town plan. And we want to thank the uh, planning department for all of their work in submitting that a designation uh, renewal application to the Department of Housing and Community Development. And we also want to thank everybody out in West Brattleboro who's been working to focus on uh, issues, development issues out there in West Brattleboro. Um, I also want to, um, Rod, would you come up, please? We want to make another award, endorse, please. Endorse the check. Of the EPA check for $400,000. <laughs> Rod, congratulations. Again. Excellent. All right. So, so, so uh, uh, we have the oversized check there. And uh, we're glad once again to note that uh, as a result of some uh, excellent work by the planning department, uh, the town of Bradford is the beneficiary of $400,000. Uh, grant which will allow us to be doing Brownsfield's evaluation work going forward in Brattleboro's downtown area, which will facilitate hopefully development and redevelopment of properties. It's townwide. Townwide, yeah. townwide, <clears throat> downtown and all over the rest of the town of Brattleboro. You look like Happy That's really Gilmore excellent opportunity. Um, third, 
Last week on August 11th, following our special meeting, uh, the select board went into executive session to discuss a number of items. And I want to speak briefly about one of those items so that we make sure that information is made available to the public as early as possible. Um, as we know from the meeting, I believe four weeks ago, uh, administration in consultation with uh, various professionals um, has been working to continue forward with the police fire uh, planning project. Um, it is not possible at this time for us to go into public session to talk about the specifics of the potential plans that we're working on because we are considering a property potentially up on Putney Road um, as to which um, we would need to secure um, ownership rights or potential option to purchase. And we're subject to confidentiality agreement that doesn't allow us to talk about that property. But um, we've had some very um, solid discussions about potential paths forward for the police fire project, ranging from um, <clears throat> numbers that are uh, below, significantly below the original cost, to numbers that still would be below the cost of what was originally approved three and a half years ago. Um, just as soon as we are able to talk about those matters in public based upon clearing up issues relating to the Putney Road uh, potential site, it is our intention to bring these matters into public discussion at the earliest possible time. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, what I said at the beginning of the executive session to last week was that the only reason we were in executive session talking about those matters was that it had to do with a potential piece of property that we don't own and that we're not allowed to talk about. Uh, but the second we've got the ability to talk about that in public, that's our intention because this is a matter of way, way clear public importance in which we want everybody to particip be participating. We want everybody to have information about. Um, there's a series of issues we're going to be talking about and it's going to involve, you know, whether we think that it's possible and appropriate to move uh, some of our emergency services operations from downtown up to Putney Road. And that's something that was discussed as a possibility probably eight or 10 months ago, I think oh, now. Yeah. But it's something that's gonna come up for probably full discussion pretty soon. And we're also gonna be talking about the fact that even if we were to do only basic life safety improvements at the current facilities, it would still probably cost us five, six, seven million dollars so that spending the additional money in order to bring us up to the current needs and the needs that uh, are reasonably foreseeable into the future at this time seems to make absolutely the most sense for the municipality as a whole. These are all things that we're going to be talking about fully in public just as soon as we can. We're actively working towards that point, but I wanted to make sure that everybody knew we had a lengthy, probably two hour executive session to talk about that. And it's our intention to talk about it in public the second that we have the ability to do so. Um, that's Chair's remarks. Next matter on the agenda is Town Manager's comments. The only thing I have tonight is just to um, piggyback on the, your presentation of the large check. Um, <laughs> large in both ways, uh, but physically large and $400,000 is certainly a tremendous amount of money for us to be able to do um, Brownfield's work to um, prepare additional sites in Brattleboro for redevelopment. Um, I just want to note that the, when the EPA regional director was here to make their ceremonial presentation of that check a few weeks back, um, he came up from Boston and he had other EPA staff with him. There were state officials here as well. Um, he took pains to talk about how much good work has been done around Brownfields in Brattleboro. Um, some of that has been in partnership with the uh, Wyndham Regional Commission, which has had received prior 
Brownfield grants and done a lot of work in our region in, in this regard, um, and some of that good work right here in Brattleboro. But um, the, the town has also done that and laid good groundwork for now what can really be a springboard forward with this $400,000. And um, he spoke very specifically and very strongly um, about the quality of the work that's been done here being um, the basis on which they are making such an investment here to allow us to move forward uh, more boldly on these. So once again, um, just adding my thanks to the planning for Excellent. Thanks, Peter. Um, next matter on the agenda is select board comments and committee reports. Do we have any? Donna? I would just like to speak briefly um, to report that the Town Arts Committee mm -hmm. met recently and I feel like both the um, content and the scope of that particular committee has really come into focus in the last little while. I think the process that we have gone through as a committee has been um, really effective in deepening the understanding of possibilities for having a committee um, impact the town in positive ways. I want to thank Dick DeGray for his contribution to that meeting and it just feels wonderful to to be doing some very intentional focus work and it feels like we're in a think tank stage and I expect some wonderful, fruitful things to emerge from from that convening. So stay tuned. John? Mine is just uh, a little bit self-preserving here. Um, Donna, it's the traffic safety committee meeting that's going to be held August 20th, 8 a.m. Thursday at 8 a.m. So if there's anybody in the Fairview Street, Maple Street area that would like to attend, I would love to see you there because I had it put on the agenda uh, because I feel it's a, it's a tough spot. So I'm just trying to get out there and get people to, to come and speak about it. So get out there, Thursday, 8 a.m. Where it's here. Right here. here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Dave? Yeah, I just I wanted to report about the uh, the finance and board committee meetings in the Wyndham Solid Waste Management District. Um, we're looking at we're keeping a close eye on commodity prices and uh, the income from the recycling and uh, <coughs> at our expenses. And we recently had an opportunity to um, <coughs> take in several tons a week of pretty pretty good quality recycling, particularly paper and cardboard from Hillsborough, New Hampshire, uh, because the facility and the work of mass that they're using has closed, and there may be some other opportunities like that. So <clears throat> the uh, management is paying careful attention to how much, what the value of that is, and what the fee structure should be so that it's covering its costs rather than requiring underwriting by the, the, the town members of the, of the waste district. And um, there's potential for hiring another staff person um, to increase the efficiency and be able to get the materials out uh, a little more quickly. Uh, we're also looking at the per ton rate for recycling for all the, the, uh, the regional towns, the member towns as well, um, because the, the amount that the commodity price is so low that with the money you get for plastic is really low, for paper it's really low, cardboard is a little better, but it's not good. Um, we're also reconsidering uh, a, a decision made. To, quite a few years ago to, to collect or to allow people to put non-recyclable plastics, in other words, numbers three through seven, in the recycling bins. One and two are the only plastics that really can be recycled. The others, we wind up paying our staff down there to pull the non-recyclable ones out and then put them in the trash and send them out somewhere else. So we're reconsidering whether to continue that. And people like to be able to just throw all their plastics together. The idea was we'd get more one and twos if people put all their plastic in the recycling, but over, I think it's it maybe as many as seven years, that hasn't turned out to be the case. Um, so rather than have it slow down the line and, and um, cause a lot of problems, we may try to educate people to not recycle those. But that decision hasn't been made. But if anybody's got any opinions, feel free to let me know, and I'll try to represent them. That sounds like it's getting close to single stream. Gradually, yeah, maybe where we go. Uh, Although yeah. that's, those facilities are struggling as well. Oh, well, yeah. Any further comments from anybody on the board? Next matter on the agenda is public participation. If somebody wants to speak to something that's not on the agenda, Mr. DeGray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, I have a couple of issues and then a question for you. Uh, in no particular order, 
Uh, I have a huge concern about uh, what's been going on downtown. And uh, we have some transient traffic. And they've been coming for the past uh, couple of years. And uh, their, their normal habits that they sit on the sidewalk and lay on the sidewalk. And the, uh, we don't have an ordinance against that. And it's extremely difficult for people to walk around and to get around. And I believe that the select board should have an ordinance that says you cannot lay or sit on our sidewalks downtown. Actually, anywhere in town. But particularly downtown, it has a huge impact on business. Uh, certainly Saturday night, there was uh, several people laying down in front of Duo Restaurant. The restaurant was full of people. Uh, I would ask you to imagine yourself taking uh, someone out for a special dinner and looking out the window and there's people laying out on the sidewalk. Doesn't mean that they're, they're bad people, but the issue is we have three parks within a half mile. We have Plaza Park, Plenty Park, and the Common with adequate benches and seating for people. They shouldn't be allowed to sit on the sidewalks in downtown Vermont, or downtown Brattleboro, and I think it's incumbent upon the board to give the uh, police a tool which they could address that situation with. The second issue that you probably have heard about, this has probably been the hottest week of the year, and our pool is closed. Uh, there is no reason for that pool to be closed. Uh, I know it's a budgetary issue, but if that's a, there's a huge capital line item, I think, for $400,000, I think, in, in the plan to upgrade the, the pool. It's open for eight weeks. And I would say uh, to have something open for eight weeks, that's a huge capital expenditure. This pool should be open this week. It should be open, actually, until Labor Day. And I think that when you go, it's hard when you're starting your budget process in October and November to, you don't remember it today. Today's 90 degrees. All as, since the pool closed on Friday, it's been extremely hot. And the kids are not back in school. And so I think that the board really needs to address that situation and change that to have the pool open to Labor Day. The last, uh, the question I have for you is, could you give us an update on the negotiations with uh, GSP? As uh, we haven't heard anything in several weeks, and I think that's uh, critical to the town, and I hope that that is going well. Thank you. I will ask administration to look at issues relating to potential ordinance um, relating to sit and lie on the sidewalk <coughs> while noting that uh, loitering statutes and ordinances can be very, very difficult for uh, mm. uh, enforcement, <coughs> but we will ask administration to look at that issue. And no, I can't provide any additional information about GSP, but when we can, we will. <coughs> to, your, to your comment, I did speak with the chief today as I saw him downtown, and uh, he said uh, he wouldn't be on board with a loitering ordinance. And I understand that. Uh, I certainly sat where you did, and I, and, and I don't either. But uh, having an ordinance where people cannot lit and sit, uh, uh, lay down on our sidewalks downtown and sit on the sidewalks, he said he could get behind that. So I would ask you just to look into that. So thank you. John? Carol, just one thing on the pool. Is there a way to figure out what it would cost us for the extra, what is it, two weeks? Um, just to give us some idea of what what we're looking at to have the yes. Small details. There we go. There we go. Um, <laughs> thanks, Rob. Um, <laughs> salaries alone are, would probably cost in the ballpark of six hundred dollars a day. Um, that's not to, not to include um, the water. You know the electric chemicals that are needed um, but that's just you know cleaning the pool cleaning the bathhouses having a full staff of lifeguards cashiers checkers um, so to to go to that that additional the, the additional two weeks well maybe just before you know we get into the budget um, if we could have something that uh, 
would kind of lay out roughly what what we're looking at mm -hmm. um, because I you know I kind of agree a little bit I mean it's been warm out you know I mean, not but, only feeling the heat, but hearing the heat. Oh, uh, I know. <laughs> but, you know, nickels are still nickels, so. Anything else during public participation? Hearing none. The next matter on the agenda is liquor commissioners. Do we have a motion to convene as liquor commissioners? So we have a motion to convene as liquor commissioners. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Are we opposed or abstaining? That carries 4-0. So we are asked to consider a catering permit for A and B Squared LLC doing business as Metropolis for the Soapbox Derby. Do you gentlemen want to come to the table or you want to stay there? Either way is fine. Okay. Come on now. Oh, go to the table. Yeah, yeah come, come to the there. table. See you on the TV. I know Daniel, it's Alan. Yep. Hey, nice to see today? you again. Nice to see you guys. All right, so maybe you want to tell us about the Soapbox Derby and then about the catering permit that you're looking for. Maybe you want to start with the Soapbox Derby. Sure, I'll make it quick. So this is our seventh annual Soapbox Derby. We do it every year. It's a community event. We see about 250 people, well, 150 to 250 people show up as uh, spectators and between 20 and 30 people who participate building cars. They're gravity powered, usually recycled and they drive them at their own peril. No, <laughs> usually it's no injuries. Um, it's quite exciting, and it's uh, more or less well attended and looked forward to by everyone that knows about it. I'm always amazed at how badly I am at getting the word out. But It's been successful over years past? Well, I mean, it makes no money. So in that sense... Well, success is measured. Um, but <laughs> in terms of bringing people alternative entertainment and uh, activities to participate in, it's greatly successful. Everyone has a smile on their face pretty much the entire time. Great. Yeah. And so this year you want to do it a little differently. Sal, why don't you talk to us about that? Um, well, it was actually really nice. Daniel approached me about possibly, um, possibly including a beer tent on the grounds for this year's event, and uh, I was really excited about that. Um, I think it's kind of a perfect environment to do it. We'll be able to have a roped off um, small area where people can um, sit or stand and enjoy a beer or a water or just conversation while still be able, being able to watch the soapbox racers go by and you know hear some of the music and enjoy the day. And um, you know I've I've been before the board several times over different um, projects and and uh, so this is something that I know I can do very safely and reasonably and would be a nice addition to you know a nice summertime public event and I'm really excited with the possibility of being able to participate and if I may add one small comment yeah. it's not unlike any other sporting event like if you go to a baseball game or I used to go to hockey games in Rochester and you know you have that access for people who are looking towards that. It's not for the racers. And we will take great lengths to make sure that the people who are racing are, are sober and safe. And I guess just to add in as well, I, uh, we've met with Peter Lynch discussing the uh, physical location of the possible uh, beer tent area. And, um, and in terms of like the physical space of it and liquor laws and what's applicable for the state and Brattleboro. Um, that's something I'm extremely familiar with. And so um, it would be a roped in area with a doorman checking IDs and everyone would be of age to enter that specific area because it's a family event. Um, the soapbox race, not the beer tent, obviously. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah. Excellent. So uh, in the materials we received, with our select board binder. Uh, there were some questions and concerns that were raised about the request to have the beer tent. And so I'm gonna ask the town manager um, to speak to those and how they've been resolved, if they have been resolved, so that we know whether any issues of concern remain and we can then ask questions. Peter? 
There is one remaining issue, and I'd like to get to that last because um, I think it's important to note that um, this was a bit of an unusual request. Different, different, we get some that become really standard for different types of activities. Um, this one, because of the fact that it is a family environment that's been uh, uh, developed around this event, um, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that there was appropriate separateness for this tent. Um, and then there were some other issues too, just related maybe more to the geography of the site, topography of the site. Um, so we've been through an extensive process of reviewing this. We had some real questions initially at staff level, we weren't sure that we'd be able to bring it forward with a recommendation to approve. Um, but over the course of the last couple of weeks, the um, proposers of the event and um, applicant tonight had worked through those issues up to and including within the last 24 hours of Pete Lynch working through some of the final things. Um, also satisfied all the concerns of the police department and any other staff issues that ar arose. So um, we're before you tonight able to um, recommend approval of the requested um, special event permit subject to um, one remaining issue, which is the permission of the uh, private property owner on whose property the tent would be erected. Um, the last I knew, which was within the last hour and a half to two hours, um, we hadn't seen that written permission. I don't know whether you've been able to bring that with you tonight or not. I'd like to speak to that. Please. Um, yes. See, I, I, there's actually a lot of moving parts to organizing an event like this, I'm sure you can imagine. So I thought that one part had been taken care of, which was, because I, I, I carry a lot of insurance for this event, and that is mostly, that includes spectators getting injured, participants getting injured, and my own personal liability, because um, my name's on it. And um, so I had to carry a special waiver this year because of this change. And so it was one of those chicken and the eggs sort of thing where my insurance agent didn't want to write the policy until he knew we were allowed to have the beer. And then the person who was going to write the agreement didn't want to write the agreement until he knew I had the insurance policy. So it was one of those sort of funny things that I didn't realize until just this afternoon. So I don't have, I'm still operating on verbal permission from the FW web company or the people that are, I point people there. So um, as of today, they should have received our, our, our liability insurance policy that includes any of the alcohol related liabilities. And I was not, I have not received, I have not received the written permission via email yet and I just checked an hour ago, um, but it might have actually been sent here is the thing. So. Well, it, it, if the board is otherwise inclined to approve the catering permit, we can do it contingent on the written permission yes. being received um, sufficiently in advance of the issuance of the permit uh, to satisfy uh, whatever legal requirements there are. I'll make so, sure that's today. I mean tomorrow. Well, but if it's not, you know, then you won't be able to serve alcohol there. But if it is, then um, if it passes, then you will. Is that comfortable for everybody? Yeah, that was my inclination yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah. And the event is August 23rd. Sunday. It's, okay. It's coming right up. I, I hope so you I come. Point on one other thing. Um, I think Mr. Blackwell's been here quite a few times. And every time, well, not, sometimes it's unique proposal, sometimes not so unique. But every time you've worked, been willing to work with the police and fire and uh, any questions and issues that we've had, and it always has worked out really well. So. Let's Everyone's see. always really fun. We're here again. That's been great. Yeah. Is there any further comments from anybody on the board? Or anybody who's in attendance? I guess we're ready for a motion. Do we want to contingent upon? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can I also add in before yeah. you yeah. actually pass sure. that, that once, um, assuming everything goes uh, well and everything's approved, that then the board will pass that information along to the uh, DLC oh, okay. with the state? Do you want to work? Well, that's, I mean, that's uh, ordinary, yeah. uh, of course. Just, I mean, right. generally catering permits, catering, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. Peter, generally yes, catering permits are issued administratively by the town clerk. Yes. That's correct. With notice to DLC. Okay, great. So yes. this is only in front of us because questions had arisen. Right, 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 right. I just, I just know there's so many moving parts. Right. I just wanted to right. well, um, make sure. I move. No. I was going to have Peter do it there because there wasn't anything written. I move to um, approve. I move that the select board approve 
the catering permit for AMB Squared LLC doing business in Metropolis for the Soapbox Derby on August 23 uh, at 101 John Sites Drive, um, consistent with the um, communications between uh, the applicant and the town manager and contingent on the town manager receiving written permission from the landowner where the event's gonna be held um, in time for the event. Could you repeat that? <laughs> I could probably. <laughs> um, anybody need clarification? No. No, it's clear. Got it, thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? That carries four row. Thanks for coming. Have fun. Thank lost. you very much, guys. You know, so now you can give notice that this like board approved, and that's all we need. Yeah, the guys. Excellent. Excellent. Thank See you guys. Thank you. So um, we're ready for, and good luck. Thanks. We're ready for a motion we're, we're to adjourn. adjourn as liquor commissioners. So moved. We have a motion to adjourn as liquor commissioners. Any discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? That carries 4 0. Um, First matter on the new business agenda is a financial report. Yes. Hi, Mr. O'Connor. Good evening, David. How are you today? Good, thank you. All right. I'm ready, John. All right, John. This is for you. I know. Um, in the uh, packet was the July financial report. And uh, for the month of July, we're 8.3% of the way through the year. And after making adjustments for the annual and semi-annual payments that were made in July, um, the general fund stood at 7.5% of its annual budget. The uh, utilities fund was at 10.2%, the parking fund was at 7.3%, and the utilities fund included an encumbrance for a sludge removal of $95,000, which, again, if that's prorated, that would bring the, um, the utilities fund expenditures to 8.7% of the annual budget, so very close to where we should be. The loan report shows that uh, we had $4,023,933 in loans outstanding as of the end of July. Um, there were three of the payments, or three of the loans had payments that were overdue, and two of the loans were in default and uh, were fully reserved. Uh, the program income report shows that we had 479,528 in available funds for additional grants and loans. And finally, the grant report um, included 20, 28 active loans or grants and seven grants in the application process as of the end of July. So again, we're starting the year with fewer grants than we showed last year, but it will pick up as the year goes along. Um, if there are any questions on any of the specific line items in the financial reports or any of the other reports, uh, I'll certainly try to answer those for you. Otherwise, that's really all I have for tonight. Dave? Yeah. Uh, John, the, the available funds for grants and loans is 479000 I recall it was around 450 seemed to sort of stabilize in 449 450 for quite a while. Is it, am I, is it up? Thirty thousand. We did somebody pay off a loan or something, or is that just I'm not remembering it properly? I, Dave, unfortunately, I just Wrong don't question. recall. I didn't. I, when I looked at the report, I didn't see a big change. So mm -hmm. probably not. Yeah, I think it, it was probably somewhere. changed gradually. And I just didn't pay attention lately. Okay, thanks, John. Are you worried at all about the overdue loans? We are slowly collecting some of those. Okay. Um, the, the, we have one that's substantially uh, overdue. They're yes. attempting to make payments. They're trying to uh, mm -hmm. become current. But they're about, uh, I believe it was about eight payments uh, mm -hmm. in arrears. Um, it's a small loan. Right. It was a disaster relief loan. Um, the business is struggling a little, yeah. uh, but they are trying to do as much as they can to bring that loan current. The others I have no problems with. Yeah, good. What about the solid waste separate budget. Do we have that in here yet? Um, I will include that next time so you can see and we can provide you with a report on that. How are we doing so far? We're doing well. Um, we, um, in July, we sold uh, 
$69,000 worth of bags wow. at retail price. Um, I'm trying to remember what the bill was from Waste Zero. I believe it was somewhere around, well, I just I can't recall that. So better that I bring the uh, information to you uh, next month and we take a look at it. And that will also break out uh, the offsetting uh, charges from Way triple zero. D? Yes. And Way Zero, Triple D as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, Triple Good. D as well. Um, we've also broken out composting from uh, um, from the trash tipping fees, so we have those separated now. So you can see how those, and those are tracking very close to what we had budgeted, okay. which was substantially less than last year. I think last year we had a budget of 275 for tipping fees for the um, trash. Uh, in this uh, solid waste fund, the tipping fees for trash this year, the budget is 140000 so substantially less than what we had last year. And we are seeing a decline in the amount of trash generated. It's down about 50%. That's pretty mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a, a, a false reading on the first couple of months on the bag sales because everybody... Is buying them. Mm -hmm. Yes. You, know, you have to buy five. Yeah. Or, no, well, they, they, they also had to stock up and, right. you know, yeah. then it's going to yeah. level off yeah. and we'll, right. we'll probably get a better reading probably yeah. three or four months down the road yeah. when everybody, hey, I can get away with only one bag every two weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Although less plastic may be recyclable pretty soon. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. But if you stomp on it before you. <laughs> um, all right, thank you. Any other questions from anybody who's in attendance about the financial report? Or anybody on the board? Well, I'm thank, just yeah, thinking yeah. it's favorable enough that we can eventually work towards keeping that pool open till Labor Day. That's there we go. Before Jumping we columns. <laughs> and a way to keep Carol <laughs> happy. We <laughs> fixed that lead. We closed that pool. Uh, we shortened the hours when? For what reason? Two years ago. About five years ago. Oh, five? About five years ago when, the, when we went through um, I was on the board then, wasn't I? Sorry about that, Carol. Was Mr. DeGray chair? That is an excellent Is he still here? Oh, the irony. He didn't say that on TV, did he? No. So, and Mr. O'Connor, it looks like the next item is just notice to us that there is a financial checklist that didn't go in June 30, uh, but is going in or has gone in now? Yes, correct. Okay, um, so we'll note that uh, there was a financial checklist that was supposed to go in that uh, wasn't on our to-do list timely, and it's now gone in. It's now gone in and it's on Excellent. our calendar, so hopefully we'll be on time next year. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> Right, so it's reviewed by select board today. And everybody's reviewed, reviewed by select board it. and signed by the select board. Very good. And there hasn't, there's not a need for other official action. Done. Besides the fact that we note that it's now been reviewed. Absolutely. Anybody have any questions about that financial management questionnaire? It does question whether select board members attend financial trainings, and if that's something that we should be doing. Um, in some degree, we're prepared to do it. And I'm in if a that lot would of make trouble. it better for the state from the state's perspective. We'll certainly do what we need. Okay. Right? Speak for yourself. <laughs> okay, then. Um, so that was the next item on the agenda, which was the uh, financial management questionnaire. So the next item on the agenda is the West River. Uh, is it the West River Park? It is. Yes, it is. Is the West River Park play structure, Ms. Lola? So good evening, uh, Carol Allott, Recreation and Parks Director. I'm here before you this evening to um, kind of as a two-part two question. Um, one, to purchase the equipment, but to purchase the equipment um, through uh, the Massachusetts Education um, Consortium, um, which is open to New England communities. Um, not just for education, but municipalities as well. And it's much like, like the state bid. And um, in your packet, um, I tried to provide some, uh, their mission statement, um, facts and questions. So any questions that you might have had ahead of time that you might have that background information. Um, one of um, 
the vendors that we've worked with, uh, with in the past, the New England Recreation Group out of Westboro, Massachusetts, um, they're the ones that we purchased the equipment for a Living Memorial at Living Memorial Park. We've had good and a good experience with them. In this situation here, we'd like to purchase what's called a Dymo mid-size Apollo uh, piece of equipment. Basically, it's a funnel uh, with, um, and it's probably you have it in your uh, packet. Um, so unique. High tech. It is high tech. It doesn't look it's cool. It's no, not it high tech. It's really cool. <laughs> it's hitting the cool meter. Um, as far as, you know, I think this will be unique to Brattleboro. There's not something like this in Brattleboro at this time. Um, it would be a, a nice addition down at, at um, West River Park. And this money is, is not budgeted money. It's money that we've raised through uh, the West River Park Committee. And um, we received a significant donation from the Brattleboro um, Retreat Board of Directors <coughs> Fund. So this, it, this particular area in the park would, would be named that um, because of the significant donation that we re received from them back when we were in the middle of the fundraising process. Um, so what we'd like to do is to be able to use the <coughs> Massachusetts Education uh, Consortium to go forward with a purchase versus putting on our RFP. So I think that Anybody on the board have any questions? Well, the only question I have is, if that's money that they've raised in donations, does it have to go through us? Yes. I mean, I know that it, yeah. you know, because we're, you know. It, it still does because it was donated to the town, and it's being expended by the town, so we follow our town purchasing okay. procedures to make the purchase. Yep. Right, I think that we also approved all the other expenditures up there, the West yeah. River Park. Correct. And what we would be doing with this, um, the park supervisor, Paul Ethier, is a certified playground inspector, installer, so we can install this in-house and not have to have those, we don't have those overhead expenses of going out and having to hire a contractor and to install this because we, you know, we are able to maintain all of our parks and, and uh, playgrounds with his um, uh, certification. He's certified. Yeah, it's a five year huh? installer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, installer. yeah, so no, we have various people in the community contact us from time to time knowing that Reckon Parks probably has somebody that is certified. And huh. um, it's a five year certification because things change all the time. Um, the so, insurance companies want, want correct. to be safe. Yeah. Yes. yeah, it's not just about the equipment, it's the impact area and all that right. that goes with the whole project. Excellent. Carol, thanks for putting all that background information because it saves us all a lot of time. I who are these people? Why are they giving us? <laughs> Why is it say Massachusetts? Yeah, it's it is. Yeah, yeah. I read. I get that. Yeah. Well, I move we approve the purchase of playground equipment for the West River Park from the New England Recreation Group in the amount of eighteen thousand five hundred dollars. Any further inquiry from the board or any further comments? Anybody who's in attendance have any questions or comments? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? That carries four zero. Great. Thank you very Thank you, much. Carol. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good night. You too. Carol, when are they going to do it? If you. Is it going to be in this year? Or? Uh, it's, it has about six to eight week lead time, so it depends when it gets here. Yep. And um, will we have time to put it in before we get to right. start making ice for the skating rink? <laughs> 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 uh, another subject. Another subject. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Next matter on the agenda is application for telecommunications tower at 1277 Putney Road. Application by Blue Sky Towers, LLC. Rod? Hello. Uh, Mr. I'm, Dodge. Uh, Hello, how are you, Mr. Chair? Colin. I'm Rod Francis, I'm the planning director, and I just want to say thank you again for your kind comments at the beginning of tonight's proceedings. It's well deserved. Nice thank you very much. So, um, I'm joined by Mr. Dodge here, who represents um, AT&T and Blue Sky, um, who propose to uh, construct a telecommunications town facility at 1277 Putney Road, which happens to be uh, the rear of the, it's the Agway um, site um, on Putney Road. So um, just a brief interlude of attractive children here while I get this going. Are these the contractors? Yeah, yeah, this is just an aesthetic test that we run. Is it as good as this? So, um, yeah, I think I'm going to do two. So, okay. this, this is you? Yeah, that's fine. And so, Mr. Dodge has a presentation. So, I'm going to open that and park it. And then um, I have some images here of the proposed project. Um, 
and uh, there's been some minor um, adjustments to the script of the draft letter. If you'd like to just uh, take one, pass it on. Sure, thank you. <coughs> so maybe we could start. Yep. Um, Rod, before I turn over to Mr. Dodge to make his presentation, maybe you could tell us, Rod, what is the uh, structure as you understand it for this application and uh, the, stroke, the application process structure and what role does the town play? I'm going to outline in very, very brief brief form yeah. what I understand and I'm sure Mr. Dodge will be able to help me out. Yeah. So um, the applicants are using the so-called Section 248A process, which is a permitting process that is um, available through the Public Service Board. Applicants in Vermont can choose whether they use the Act 250 process or the Section 248A process of the Public Service Board. Public Service Board requirements and the Act 250 requirements are both subject to um, controlling regulations from the Federal Communications Commission and um, both reflect the Vermont statutes uh, approach to resolving the issues of locating telecommunications towers. Within the Section 248A process, applicants um, actually end up showing you know, a large technical document such as this. This is a printout of the application now before the Public Service Board. And it uh, goes through the technical justification for the installation of the facility. It shows what could be referred to as propagation maps, the area that would receive the telecommunications coverage if the facility was installed, and makes a judgment about whether the proposed facility makes an undue adverse impact with regard to aesthetics, um, scenic values, or open space. And for the, somewhat oddly, the Public Service Board under uh, Section 248A uses a similar test to Act 250, the so-called Quichi test, which establishes in a two-part system whether in fact there is undue of whether there is adverse impact, and then subsequently, is it undue? Um, and so that is what um, Mr. Dodge and uh, will be uh, taking through the uh, 248A process uh, subsequent to this meeting. As part of the 248A process, communities are able to either A, comment informally in a 45-day period um, when the applicant is signaling intent to apply for a certificate of public good. They are referred to as petitioners in this Section 248A process, and the petition is to seek a certificate of public good from the Public Service Board. When you go before the Act 250 process, the terminology is different, but the outcome is roughly the same. You get a permit to install a tower. Um, the community had the ability to um, simply fill out a questionnaire, you know, acknowledge that they understood that there was a, a proposed project um, for their town and make any comment informally outside the formal um, process of 248A. We deferred doing that because we collected feedback from the Conservation Commission and the Planning Commission and signaled through the town manager to the board that um, we felt that you might have a, an interest in this topic. And so our schedule didn't quite meet the 45-day uh, early notice period. And so we will now be passing our comments directly to the Public Service Board. Thank you. Is that OK? Yeah. Does Mr. Dodge disagree? No, I agree. <laughs> the only thing that I would add is that as part of the process, the same 45-day package that the town received was also received by all the adjoining property owners and several state agencies, Department of Transportation, Public Service, Agency of Natural Resources. So and, also, the chance. and also the Wyndham Regional Commission. Right. And Excellent. The well, then you pass the test. <laughs> <laughs> it's always relief. <laughs> all right. So, um, so what should we do next? Well. We have kind of dueling uh, presentations here. I guess I have a very Mr. Dodge's uh, submission to to the town and to the public service board includes a series of images 
um, which uh, demonstrate using Photoshop basically uh, what the tower would look like at the site and then using um, balloons on a day back in July, late July, um, indicating how or wh and where you would see the tower from. And so I, there were something like 18 or 20 images and I culled it so that we could get a sense of where you would better see the tower from and under what circumstances. So if you want to go th quickly through the images. Yeah. No, I'd getting, rather do yeah. it the opposite direction. So what I'd like to do mm -hmm. is I'd like to give Mr. Dodge, since it's his application, sure. the opportunity to tell us what he wants. And then since you act on behalf of the town and there's some concerns that you've raised as expressed in the letter that was distributed, we'd then like you to tell us what your concerns are. Great. Good. So uh, let me just, the only penalty that I see here is that you're an Apple user, right? Uh, yes. So it are may be a little bit distorted. All right. distorted, but that's all right. I think that we can I, we can try to cut to the, or I'll try to cut to the chase as quickly as I can, Mr. Chair. So I appreciate everybody's time and being here, and I realize that you have a, a number of different um, um, projects to discuss tonight. So do you want it just on if the? You can just put it on play. Just, uh, like that. Yeah, See, David, you, you messed up the whole thing. <laughs> Well, that's because that's it's good. Apple and PC. I think the, we've read today that the select board has in front of it is a, a proposed draft response to the Public Service Board. And we've reviewed that, and we've also reviewed the one that came from the, um, from the Regional Planning Commission. The, the letter that came from the Regional Planning Commission last week had what I would call similar concerns to what's expressed in the letter. And I think specifically it's about height. The reason that I put this particular um, photograph on, and by the way, I'm happy to provide this to the town so that you have it afterwards and we'll submit with public service. Board, <laughs> is that, right, of course. You do. What this shows is uh, on the right hand side of the screen, there is the current, what we call the cellular on wheels facility or cow. That's there now and that's about 100 feet tall. In the foreground or in the middle of the picture, is a simulation of what the new tower would look like. So the, um, the cow right now is on property of Brattleboro Development Corporation. The, um, the new site has just moved over a little bit onto um, the land, the, the Agway land. And that was for a number of reasons, not because anything went wrong with the development corporation, but simply because they have other uses for the property. So we started exploring areas around, um, around uh, th this same area. So the coverage map that I'm showing up on the screen right now, you'll see that there's green splotches that are demonstrating where AT&T has what's called 1900 coverage or LTE. If you watch television, you'll see all kinds of ads or if you go to your um, cellular retailer, all companies are trying to sell LTE now. And the reason for that is because people are relying on data much more than they're just relying on regular old phone service. And what the carriers are all trying to do is provide the same level of data coverage as cellular coverage uh, may exist now, or in AT&T's case, better. Just briefly, what happened with AT&T is that they acquired the assets of Unicell back in 2008, 2009, but Verizon acquired all of Unicell's assets over in New Hampshire. So the effect in this region was like a giant zipper being opened. It was as though all the AT&T was on one side but not the other, all the Verizon was on the New Hampshire side but not the Vermont side, and the effect, especially on AT&T's network, was to get really um, patchy, especially on 91. And that's part of the reason for this, one of the reasons for this project. So right now, before we had the cellular on wheels facility, you can see that basically right around exit three, uh, in particular, and along the interstates, there's all kinds of patches where there was really no LTE coverage. The cow is helping out. It's 100 feet tall, and it's doing some good, but there are still places where a customer's call will drop, either to the north of that blue area that's shown on the screen, or especially to the south, where that bridge is that crosses Route 30, and I'll show that um, in a little bit. If we um, are approved at the height of 140 feet, we will solidly cover that area and not have any further problems along the interstate, as well as covering a lot of the river, parts of New Hampshire, Route 5, and that uh, industrial area around where the Agway is. Now, I'm just showing you a picture briefly. 
of the area in question that we're, that we're concerned about. The reason I'm showing this is because what's in the recommendation letter um, that's proposed before you is to reduce the tower to a height of 100 feet. And so we have another propagation map that shows that if, well, what this shows is that if we, in this, in this very same area that I'm showing on the screen, where Route 30 and I-91 cross the river, if we have that 140 feet, we will essentially cover that gap. If you, see, if you look at where the red circle is on the screen, we're basically able to ensure that there won't be a call drop for a customer. If we go to 100, we get that very large gap, and that's a gap that can't be recalibrated to address um, technologically speaking. And the only way really to get at, at dealing with this particular coverage gap would be to bring the facility closer toward central downtown Brattleboro. And for all kinds of reasons that are expressed well in your town plan, we don't want to do that. Not to mention there's not very good land um, or people who are willing to put a structure there in comparison to the, com the commercial industrial area. Now, what if we went to 120 feet? We're still going to have a gap what our radio frequency engineers at AT&T tell us is that they may be able to compensate for that to try to ultimately remedy the situation. It might, be, it might even vary at different times of the year, but that might be something that we're willing to do, particularly if, um, if either the board or even the town found that that was an appropriate level of mitigation. But the 100 feet, just to go back, is something that we can't really get around. The only other thing that I'll say before I, I hand it back over, um, in terms of scenic resources, what the, what the maps in the very voluminous document that we provided essentially show is that the most visible sections along public roads of this particular facility is obviously right in that commercial area. That's all that red that's shown in the center of the screen. But as far as residential areas, almost all of them are in New Hampshire uh, and, not, and from pretty far away, like more than a mile uh, on average. Um, this is one of the views from the interstate southbound that you would see for the tower at 140 feet. This is another, um, this is that gap that I'm talking about. So you're from the top of the hill going down towards that, that bridge. You'll be able to see the facility from there, but as you can see, it's not very prominent and to some degree blends with all that other commercial um, structures that are down in that section of town, basically the CVS. Um, and you'll see also that it's not breaking any ridge line for people who are coming through in terms of a real scenic resource that the, that the town has. I would say this is the, the picture that most accurately shows what it will look like from the river. So you'll see that it's peering atop, atop the trees. Of course, the, the part of this technology that we can't change is that it's line of sight technology at the end of the day. Notwithstanding the migration to data, you still, the antennas still need to be able to see where the handsets and the people are. Um, one of the ideas that we have in addition to potentially exploring going down to 120 would be instead of a sort of a gray or a white pole to go to a brown pole. And we're especially thinking about that and we would be um, thinking of, of comments because of that backdrop that you have when you're looking at it from the, from the top of that topography on, um, on Interstate 91. So that's all that we really wanted to say to address the letter specifically. Obviously, I'm happy to, to answer any other questions. Okay. Thank you. Rod? Unless anybody from the board's got any questions right now. I do in a minute, but not yet. Two. Okay. All right. So there's going to be some overlap here because of using the same images. So. Um, I appreciate that previous photo that actually compared the cow to the proposed uh, structure here. Um, and then, um, so what I wanted to do was, um, show you, th this is, th this is the similar, um, th this is the same image and, uh, we can switch backwards and forwards backwards and forwards. I would say that this is um, a scenic, you know, there's this clear scenic value associated with this and the question would be, I think, for the Public Service Board to determine whether an average person would expect the installation of a tower at this point, um, assuming that there are no alternatives. And I think that the, the, the height reduction and or some kind of mitigation with the um, with the design of the tower could could be beneficial. And again, to go back to this 
to this image. Um, what's, what's challenging for us with this one is, although it doesn't break the ridge line, um, we think that under the right conditions as you approach this, the prominence of the installation of the actual antenna on top of the tower is going to give it some visual bulk that will make it stand out. Um, this is a hazy day, there's plenty of hazy days, but there are plenty of really clear days. If you, if you also make an adjustment here, so where you see, I'm not sure if my little mouse is not really showing up today, but this area here is the construction of the new bridge. And so what's really important to actually understand here is that as you, traver as you travel on the new bridge, you're actually going to be a little bit lower and a little bit further over so there are some adjustments that you would need to make in the line of sight that would mean that we think that this tower is going to be more prominent and more in the line of sight for a longer period of time than you might be able to determine from the existing roadway. And the state and the town and the region have spent um, significant time and resources making sure that this new bridge is uh, something that frames the scenic qualities of the West River um, valley and the Connecticut River uh, in a very important, you know, in a very sensitive way. And we think that again, to repeat, the community, the average person might have an expectation that that view is not marred or impacted by a facility such as this. And then while we're on this image, you'll notice there's just one little tree that seems to be growing a lot faster than all That's the together. others. And, and it's this one right here. It's a real tree. Well, actually, no. <laughs> no it's, it's, not. it's a stealth monopine, is the name of the cell phone tower, and it's owned by Verizon. And so the question that we would have and the, the challenge that we've got is that the very limited nature of the 2488, the section 2488 process doesn't allow us to interrogate the applicant prior to the proceedings or even due the, during the proceedings about what alternative sites were explored, how they were explored up to and including what would be the barriers from a contractual standpoint and a legal standpoint to co-locate on an existing tower. Mr. Dodge has been very kind to share that in fact one of the consequences for the you know, the fallout between AT&T and Verizon is AT&T are now backfilling effectively coverage in this part of the state as a consequence of a change in the contractual climate between them and their competitor, Verizon. But I don't think that the Public Service Board means us as a community to bear the brunt of what are arguably the negotiations between to publicly held companies who are fighting over cell phone territory. So the question for me is why would we want to host a facility such as this when the real rationale is that it's something to do with a contractual uh, dispute or resolution between two entities that we have nothing to do with. And so um, our concern is actually not so much with the applicant in this instance or the project, but the very limited nature of the Section 248A process, which doesn't allow us the full information and doesn't give us the ability to A, be in front of the Public Service Board themselves, and B, to work with the information that we think is reasonable in making a decision. So um, I think Mr. Dodge has been helpful in showing you the technical limitations of the location at a lower height. What I'd also argue there is, is that um, at 65 miles an hour, that stretch of road is probably less than three seconds. There are plenty of other instances on 91 between here and Springfield, Vermont, where you're gonna lose cell reception for a whole lot longer than three seconds, no matter what you carry it. And so the question I would also pose is, what level of service are we expected to um, ensure here or what you know? What is a reasonable community standard? And again, what we're being asked to do is weigh the visual impact of this installation against some putative hypothetical improvement in the reception qualities of a subset of the total market for AT&T only. Okay. So um, rather than all residents, all users all travelers. We're not talking about that at all. We're talking about a subset of their entire market. 
Um, and so, again, the question would be, to what extent as a community are we expected to actually accommodate that interest, that commercial interest, of, without deriving any compensation or benefit for the impact on, on uh, scenic values or aesthetics and, you know, subject the residents and travellers to a, to a visual impact that they could reasonably expect not to confront. So if you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them. I mean, just I yeah, respond we'll briefly, Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah, please. Sure. That's, so, that's so, so what I would say is that it's more that these impacts, when you don't have reliable service along the interstates, are more than just hypothetical. They are something that not just AT&T, but the whole state government gets complaints about from constituents um, at the legislative level, at the agency level, and was in fact what uh, led to us originally bringing the cow onto the Brattleboro Development Corporation property, which is that when it's generally known that an area has poor cell service and it's unreliable, it dissuades people from going there in the first place. Um, so. We think that the, the, the real importance of this at the end of the day is to fix what is not a problem just for people from out of state, but for everyone who travels uh, along this route. Um, what the visual impact shows is that the, the, the tower from the location that we were talking about will essentially disappear when you get to the bottom of the bridge. And I, I'm inclined to say, and I think we can show at the public service board level, that that would be true even notwithstanding the very... Uh, the very well understood point about the, the bridge and the highway moving. The other point that I would say, though, is that the Public Service Board procedure actually does address this issue of co-location in a way that Act 250 and some town ordinances do not. One of the criteria that we have to satisfy is to demonstrate that there's no reasonable options for co-location. Now, it's true that we did not address the Verizon Tower specifically in the petition. But that is something that we would absolutely will be willing to do. And any other sites like that that the town wants to know about, if you put that in your letter, that's something that we will uh, respond to and address. And the town absolutely can participate. Part of the criteria, another one of the, the criteria and what differentiates 248A from the other statutes, permitting statutes, is that the board is required to demonstrate substantial deference to the town and the regional planning commission unless we as the applicant or the petitioner show good cause to do otherwise. So this is absolutely a reasonable thing to ask us to do, and we're happy to do it. What I would encourage you to do, though, is to think about whether how important that 100 feet is compared to 120 feet, and if there's any um, further possibility of changing that in the letter, as well as thinking about alternate designs, because that's something that we would certainly uh, be happy to look at doing and maybe adjust some of the simulations to demonstrate what would that would look like. Yes, would you go back nice. to the view from the bridge, please? Okay. The view from the bridge. View from, from the bridge? Yeah. Sure. They oh, you mean up 90? <coughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, that's even, yeah, that is better. The, um, when we were talking about the solar panels over here, there was this great concern about, you know, being able to see them. And this, I mean, here's this little, here's the tower. And all of this other gray stuff there is CNS wholesale. And that's what dominates your view when you come across that bridge. Right. And to worry about anything else that's going to provide any kind of service at all, to me, it just seems, I'm not sure why we worry about it. It's not, um, I mean, Seltzer is really important. Uh, people, you know, we have repu Vermont's reputation of not having very good service. I don't, we, we need, well, yeah. that to, CNS and that motel dominate the view there. It's not going to be pretty, whatever they do with the bridge. You don't see the river, I'm pretty sure they're not designing the bridge so the drivers going by can look over and admire the West River. The idea is to keep your eye on the road and get through there. So I think as far as, you know, the, the the bridge looking nice from down below has nothing to do with how it looks going across at the top. And I just think, I don't think it's a big enough problem to, to say no to. I have a whole series of them, and it's along the same lines. Um, I, have, I have absolutely no problem with the height of it at 140. Um, I, I was against the, the solar panels 
because I thought they were going to be aesthetically unpleasing. Um, that whole area from exit two to three, it's been argued over the years, over the years, over the years as being this uh, scenic corridor. I don't, I don't get it. I, I don't know. Maybe I've been in Southern Vermont too long. Um, <laughs> the old Fergit tractor building, they have an antenna on top of that. They do. How high is that? Do you know? Any any idea? That thing is, is ugly as sin. And that's got to be up there 120, 130 feet. Uh, it doesn't have that big bulbous thing on the top. It's a, lattice, it's a lattice work that tapers. Right. It's a ham radio. Right. But it's still up there. It is still up there. Um, I don't believe it's much more than 100. I, I doubt it's over 120. It's probably more like 100. Okay. It's just so, in a very prominent spot. So that's, that was just one of my questions. Um, I also feel that in the foreseeable future, telecommunications is going to change leaps and bounds and probably getting away from towers. I, you know, I, I'm just seeing that between satellites and everything else that, you know, I don't think this is going to be a long-range thing with towers being the only way that you're going to be able to signal from one spot to another. Um, are the abutters, and I've got just a whole bunch. Do you mind if I go through them all? Go for it. Okay. Uh, the abutters, uh, are there, Rod, are the abutters, have they complained? I mean, is there a big uproar about? Uh, we've had some this? inquiries, but we've had. Okay. Yeah. The other thing, too, is, and I'm wondering if we can use this tower to our advantage. Don't we have repeaters uh, that we're using in town that we've had a hard time placing every now and then between the police and the fire? And, we, we do have a repeater system. Um, I can speak with staff about whether they feel there's still gaps. My mm -hmm. overall impression, Patrick may want to add detail to this, is that um, when we lost the service on Wantasket, yeah. um, it caused the town to have to go and set up right. a system that is indeed a, a network where different parts of town are served by different antennas. But I'm not, I don't have the impression that we have substantial gaps in that system that right. um, compromise public safety. So. I, th I think you're, you're spot on. There, there really isn't uh, substantial gaps at this point, whether or not this location would serve to supplement. That's what I'm um, You know, the value of the existing network remains, you know, I think a radio frequency engineer yeah. would need to take a look at it in how it would, mm -hmm. you know, um, supplement our existing network. But there really isn't, given all the changes that we've done in right. the last two years, um, uh, the, the same level of problem out on the north end of town. Well, I'm just wondering if that's something that AT&T would, would, you know. Actually, it would be Blue Sky, and they would absolutely, sky. yeah, they would you know, want to do that. If we had, you know, if we had a, a, a spot in there, you know, could we put something on there in lieu of, you know, so. Um, I think that's that's about it. You know, I just I, I like David said. I I just I, I think we're making a little bit of a mountain out of a molehill here. Um, I, I I just don't see it as a as a huge problem. So I don't know. I come at it from a different place. That away, Donna. Um, I don't think it's a mountain out of a molehill at all. And I just want to say I, I'm not a fan of the constant contact. I don't think the momentary lapse of service is an issue. I don't think we should be on our phones on the highway. I'm, I partly live a good portion of my life on Interstate 91, all up and down from Springfield, Mass, up to Burlington. Um, and I think that part of, and I was absolutely in favor of the solar panels, but I feel very differently about this particular issue because I think it's a slippery slope. Um, I that walk that I do that, it, that is from the base of Juan Tasticate to Route 9 is an unbelievably gorgeous scenic view in Vermont. And to begin to put towers up, especially something at 140 feet, I would not be in favor of. Um, and I argue whether it's necessary at all. I think it's an eyesore. I think it's important for certain organizations and individuals to be constantly reachable. Um, I don't think this community needs that tower, and I have strong feelings about it. Can I just have one rebuttal? <laughs> <laughs> it's not really a rebuttal. It's more of a... Go ahead, John. And, and this, is, this is what happened to me at, at one time on that stretch. I was calling 911 from that area 
for the fire on top of Wantastican, and I lost service. Mm -hmm. You know, so yes, you shouldn't be on your phone. We all are. We all are hands free, and as much as we don't want to be on our phones, we are on our phones. And uh, so I, I lost a call in that area, and and I always thought, well, you know, yes, we are in constant communication. We are, the, you know, we're the the Facebook, we're the Twitter, we're the society. Um, but in some cases, you know, it could be. It could be dangerous, and it could be a, a life-threatening situation. That's all that happened to me, and that's the only thing I can relate to, to what happened during, in that section to me personally. So, you know, I just, again, I, and I totally agree with you, Donna, on, on some things. I have uh, uh, two questions. First, and then a procedural observation. Oh. First. Rod, do you have any position about the difference between 140 to 120 to 100? You know you have an issue between 140 and 100. What about at 120? Do you know yet? I think I'd like to see some simulations at 120, but I think that 120 would still address a large number of our concerns. So for instance, to go back to this image, that is something that could be cured by by 120. All right. The second question I have relates to uh, timing. Uh, so we've now missed preliminary mm -hmm. comments. What's the deadline for submission of a letter to be considered by the Public Service Board? At this, do you want to answer that, or actually, the comment the comments are due on the September 4th. Yes. And so, as I understand it. Um, the uh, petition was filed on the 14th of August last week, the so 13th. If we and so the, yeah. it hasn't been issued a docket number yet. It, Correct. So if we approve a letter, if we can get a majority on the first, then uh, we can get that submitted electronically or... That will see it electronically. They'll appreciate it electronically? Probably from my cell phone. Just joking. Well, and then what I'll observe procedurally is that there's some open issues here. Yes. Number one, and but more importantly, um, I mean, I'm closer to Donna's position than to the other two board members. I endorse the form of letter as it's been circulated to the board this evening, um, but. There's two to two right now, and so the board doesn't have really the ability to act to approve a letter yeah. at this point. Yeah. And so there's some follow-up that needs to be okay. done in terms of, Rod, you're looking at the 120 versus right. 140, can you, can you whether that addresses concerns. Second, um, uh, you might want to make a recommendation to us about it being a green or a brown pole mm -hmm. to see if it fades better into the background. And then number three, we might consider amending the letter to refer specifically to the Verizon Stealth Monopole. Yes. Um, because we don't have that specific alternative reference in here, and there's a number of places in the letter where we could make that specific reference so that um, uh, the Public Service Board knows that we're looking at something specific. Um, Peter? Would the applicant um, provide some additional images? Between yes, now and our next meeting to, to show the difference in the height. That's what we were just talking about. Is I think what we would do is and, and understand that I need I still need to talk with my client about this because there's different concerns and there's two clients. That's a that's another story. But I think the point is that what we would end up proposing is probably depending on how the outcome might be something where we we go to 120 if the R F engineers say it's okay. We would build in some expandability on the tower with the understanding that the way the Public Service Board works, you can never go up from the height of a tower without going through a subsequent approval where everybody gets notice on. So that might be a reasonable compromise in this case. And then we can talk, probably the best is for us to communicate okay. independently about the, the color. So to be would, would we be able to see images for the September 1st select board meeting of what 120 looks like and also what the darker colors yes. look like? Yes, we probably do them both together. In other words, okay. we do. Dark right. color, 20 feet shorter. Yeah, and you know, the only other question is, is whether we can have some follow-up discussions about John's suggestion about 
not being able to locate some up pole because that could impact the town's position. It's right. I'm not sure that it does, but it's okay. certainly should be addressed. I'm so absolutely all for mitigating as much, you know, if you can change the color of it to make it blend in better, you know, I'm, I'm all for that. But we do not want a tree at that location the way the Verizon has right. there. Okay. It would look for obvious really reasons. Odd. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, just one, can I have one point? Yeah, yeah are you okay? So there's just one point of clarification that I want to just want to respond to one of the comments from John. And while Mr. Dodge is here, it would be interesting, I think, to hear his reaction. So um, the question of the scenic nature of the I-91 corridor is important. The I-91 is a scenic byway, as is uh, 89, as it turns out, in Vermont, and so which is a federal designation. And there are certain thresholds that you have to achieve to do that. So, for instance, without wanting to be too pointed about it, I-91 in southern Mass southwestern Massachusetts doesn't qualify as scenic. Um, so, um, the understanding that I have is that it's 500 feet either side of 91, where you are required to review the state through the Act 250 and Section 248A process is required to review projects uh, with, a, with, a, with a view to preserving the scenic byway status. The tower that you see here, I measured it to be about 1,000 feet from I-91, um, the roadway. So it's clearly located some distance outside the corridor, but its visual impact is clear. And so um, I think that uh, any mitigation efforts on the part of the applicant would be uh, well received by both the Public Service Board and, and us. And so what I'd be eager to explore is the m minimizing of the height and or color changes to accommodate that. And so there's an objective way of actually doing this, but really the, the, the line of sight here brings this tower into the range you know, the, of a person traveling the I-91 corridor, and so therefore it is something that I feel could reasonably re be reviewed under that standard, despite the fact that its physical location is some distance further away. Partly because of the turn that you also see happening here. So by the time you're actually parallel to the pole, it's less of an issue. It's actually as you approach the pole from the south that is the single biggest issue, I, th I feel. So, I'm happy Can I just, to you to respond. just respond briefly? The other thing about byways, and VTrans is the one that's told us this, is a byway is not just about scenery. It's also about economic development. So, for instance, the Mad River Byway, which is further up north, Route 100 is a constant source of complaints about poor cell service. And so that's a place where the VTA and others of the Department of Public Service have asked us to try to focus some of our efforts. Um, so I agree with you that there's, there is some balance there, but it's certainly not weighted completely toward absolute scenic preservation. There's an economic component to it as well. I, I think we lost the balance when the solar panels were put in, because uh, I, I just felt that they were, I, I didn't I didn't like them. And they, they are really close. I mean, they're within They're within feet. 500 feet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so right. that's where okay. right. And that further points out uh, an issue with this entire process, right? And we should uh, take our best uh, shot at expressing whatever concern mm -hmm. uh, the board has on behalf of the town. But ultimately, the concerns we expressed with respect to the solar development were <laughs> not taken into consideration, particularly uh, when the development was approved. So. We'll just see what all the way happens. My concerns will take it. Yeah, yeah, I know yours work. I yeah. have it. Yeah. <laughs> Build it fast. Right. Michael, Build it fast. It looks yeah. like grass, he said. And, and <laughs> you know, looks like trees. Green. Yeah, it's like growing, growing, you know, solar panels. <laughs> um, so uh, we want to thank you for coming and talking with thank us. Thank you. Thank um, you for your Rod, time. thank you as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, nice we'll put it back on the agenda nice for September 1st to see if we can get yeah. some uh, agreement at that point about what kind of letter we want to send, if at all, and um, whether you decide to attend or not, you know, that's up to you. Rod can present that yeah. information, but it's really your call.
Are you Thanks okay for coming. keeping the PowerPoint? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Any further agree? I didn't ask if anybody was in attendance wanted to speak to this matter. Is there anybody who's in attendance who wants to speak to this matter? I guess not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Next matter on the agenda is energy audits for the municipal buildings. Um, Oh, that's Patrick who's going to speak to us about that. Right? You, uh, like you don't need this team. Nice to see the energy team back again. Haven't seen you guys in a while. You need to pick me of this with you or hold a bit. Like right. urgently? Or? Um, I'll need that. You can take that. I'll get out of your way. Okay. I'm not cold. Oh. And so the contagious catch Well, so you know, you, you, you so, could. So last night. Uh, you're beat. certainly welcome. Ten three. Um, might need to bring your own chairs, but it just said low cell fuel, so I didn't want to deal with it. And then we changed the battery. Oh, okay. It kept saying low cell for a little while. There you go. Let's go ahead. So good evening, um, Patrick Moreland, assistant town manager, and I've brought some some colleagues here. You can introduce Truth. themselves. Uh, Ted Montgomery. Paul Cameron. Bob Reuter. Hi. Hi. Excellent. So uh, we're here Very this colorful, evening. By the way, thank you. Yeah. 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 It was planned. It was planned. A lot of energy. On it. A lot of energy. <laughs> Patrick is a wonderful coordinator. <laughs> all right. All right. Not of not of fashion. Uh, um, so, good evening. We're, we're here this evening to follow up on some work that uh, we brought to the board back in April. Uh, at the time, we brought to the board a uh, request, for request for qualifications, and the purpose of the RFQ was to help to identify the proper vendor with which to perform energy audits on some rather difficult and complex uh, municipal facilities. Um, at the time, um, we proposed to the board uh, a, a project that involved eight buildings. Um, at the time also, the select board established a, a, an ad hoc review committee, and on that committee, uh, the board put uh, Bob Reuter, uh, Lester Humphreys, uh, both from the uh, energy committee, Paul Cameron, who's the town uh, energy coordinator, and then put myself and finance director John O'Connor. Um, I would like to point out that while he was not officially appointed as a member, Tad Montgomery uh, uh, attended virtually every meeting, participated uh, in, a, in a significant and effective manner, and uh, was a valuable asset uh, of the process, uh, the results of which we're bringing for uh, your consideration this evening. Um, each of the members of the committee uh, scored the proposals uh, that we received in response to our RFQ. We received a total of 15. Uh, they were very different from one another, from very small organizations, uh, you know, sole proprietors that, that responded to very large organizations with, you know, teams of engineers that could be brought to, to, to the task. Uh, they were local firms. There were firms as far away as San Francisco. Um, each of the members of the, of the ad hoc committee independently reviewed uh, the RFQ, and we narrowed the process after a couple of meetings down to three firms. Those three firms uh, we then interviewed uh, for an hour each uh, over a course of three days. And the consensus uh, view of the ad hoc committee was to um, select the firm called Seeds uh, and, and their uh, sole proprietor, Margaret Dillon. Um, in order to sort of prepare a project for the board to consider, like we included in the uh, proposal today, um, we invited Margaret to come and meet with us to, to take a day and to examine each of the properties under consideration, the Municipal Center, uh, the Gibson Aiken Center, uh, the Transportation Center, uh, Freshwater Treatment Plant, Retreat Wells, um, library. Help me out, what am I missing? Library. The, the Brooks Memorial Library and Public Works Public Garage. Works, and the Public Works Garage, there you go. Uh, so, so this was an opportunity to walk uh, Margaret through each of the properties so that she could get a sense. She wasn't, she wasn't there really to perform any energy analysis, but really to just 
size up the buildings to get a sense of access, to get a sense of, all right, how many floors, how do I access the basement, how do I access the, uh, the roof, et cetera, so that she could put together meaningful estimates of how much time it was going to take her at each location, and then we could put together a project that we would uh, bring to the board and discuss. Um, simultaneous to this, uh, it, was, it, was, it was acknowledged that there are at least two other uh, state entities that could potentially have overlapping um, um, benefit to the town in terms of evaluating our facilities. One of which is Efficiency Vermont, which I think most folks are aware of. Uh, they provide a series of incentives to uh, property owners to provide uh, um, energy efficiency upgrades. The town has worked with Efficiency Vermont uh, over the course of the years and made a variety of improvements to uh, town facilities that have yielded uh, significant savings in terms of uh, uh, our costs on energy. And so we wanted to make sure that as uh, uh, Margaret had the opportunity to look at our building, she was also simultaneously aware of the benefits of coordinating with Efficiency Vermont. In addition to Efficiency Vermont, we uh, are aware that uh, there is an initiative underway uh, on part of the state called Wyndham Wood Heat. And this is uh, a, as a consequence of the Clean Energy Development Fund initiative here in Wyndham County to determine if uh, a transition to wood heat at municipal and school facilities is warranted. So um, after having uh, taken a look at all the buildings, um, we organized a meeting where Margaret and the members of the uh, uh, ad hoc committee got together with uh, some folks from Efficiency Vermont and some representatives of Wyndham Wood Heat uh, to talk about the, the project coming before you and to work out how we would coordinate all of these efforts uh, simultaneously in the same project. And I think the, the result of that is, is the uh, proposal uh, you have before you. A uh, couple of things that I think might be important to, to recognize is while the town initially uh, proposed the scope to include but eight buildings, uh, while we were at each of these facilities, it became pretty clear that there were ancillary structures at each of the locations. Typically, these were pump houses. Um, and that these pump houses might, in fact, be um, very likely candidates for cost-effective um, uh, energy projects. Uh, there's cinder block buildings, they have electric resistance heat, um, and so th these would be fertile ground for cost effective um, and uh, 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 cost effective projects that would have a, uh, a quick return on the investment. And so um, the proposal uh, that uh, was included in the in the package, it's a little complicated and a little uh, difficult perhaps to, to consider, uh, but in essence what you have here is a, a base proposal put forward by seeds of about $23,820 and then there are a variety of potentially additional um, uh, work on a building by building basis that would be undertaken if it uh, if it appears reasonable and prudent, uh, both to our uh, to the to the vendors and technical consultants we would be working with, and also to uh, management of the town. So um, there is a, a, a sort of a series of base costs for the energy efficiency uh, analysis that would occur at each building, and that's itemized for you here. There are potential costs if we are to go forward with uh, an analysis of wood heat at a given location, or if we were to go forward with an analysis of a transition to an electric heat at a given location. In either instance, uh, in the proposal that uh, Margaret prepared, uh, it, it demonstrates the maximum possible uh, cost to the town. Uh, and in one model, it's around 32,000. In the other model, it's 34,000. So um, looking at that, what we have proposed is um, for the board to authorize the, the, the town to work with uh, Margaret Dillon and Sustainable Education, excuse me, Sustainable Energy Education Demonstration Services, and to proceed with all 14 locations, the eight originally proposed, along with the six additional pump houses, um, and to manage and oversee the project uh, at a not to exceed dollar limit of 36, uh, 220, and that would include a, a small contingency uh, for potentially unforeseen challenges that arise. 
Uh, just just to make clear, the source of the funds for the project would come from the uh, energy efficiency fund that the board proposed and, and uh, uh, the town meeting served to seed with uh, 45000 this last year, of which uh, seven or 8000 I think, has been spent on previous energy efficiency projects, including some transition for street lights, uh, some changes at the public works garage, some changes here, um, and the balance of that fund at the present time has about $37,000 uh, available for use. This project at its maximum, we propose, would be 36220 and it's, it's entirely possible it, it would be considerably less. Is there anything you guys want to? Is it not true, Patrick, that there is a high likelihood that efficiency Vermont will contribute to part of the cost of the audits, and that thirty-six thousand may come down to as much as half of that? It, it, it's it, it's close to true. It, the the format is true. The format is true. The actual cost what is close to true. <laughs> it's close to true in that the the actual cost of all activities would likely, under certain scenarios, be as much as forty five thousand. And with the cost share that that could come either from efficiency Vermont or from Wyndham Wood Heat, the the the, the dollar would get lowered into the thirty two to thirty four thousand dollar range. So um, there is certainly, um, after having uh, coordinated with those other initiatives, there is the possibility that if work is undertaken in coordination with them, that depending upon their specific programmatic uh, guidelines, there would be a cost share between the town and, and, uh, and either Efficiency Vermont or, or Wyndham Wood Heat. Questions from the board? Yeah, a couple of um, comments. Uh, Patrick, you mentioned um, electric heat, and by that you mean heat pumps, air to air heat pumps or something. You mentioned wood or, wood or electric. You're not talking about electric wasteboard resistance. I, I, I think the wood, and, and I'm not an expert in this area, but I understood the almost shock and, and horror of running into electric resistance heat in the pump houses, so I'm, I'm yeah. pretty confident that's not one that. of the uh, right. uh, models that uh, right. uh, Efficiency Vermont would, would be supportive of. And I, right. and I think they were interested in heat pumps as a potential cost effective. Well, for a building that you want to cool as well as heat, that's the, obviously, well, that's the best way to go in terms of that use. Um, the other question, um, you mentioned the, the window would heat. If one of the facilities or several of the facilities are recommended that w uh, would, uh, you know, would, a pellet boiler would be a, um, you know, the, the, the advantageous way to proceed. Does that, would we then get some money from them for this to compensate us for these appraisals? The, the, there would be a cost share. The cost share is far more easier to understand with Wyndham Wood Heat. It's a uh, 75 25 right. with. Uh, Wyndham would heat picking up 75% of the cost right. of the analysis and 25% and picked right. up by the town. So um, that worked, okay. I just wanted to understand how that worked. Um, that's it. I, Other questions from anybody? Yeah, I guess, I, and any of the, I don't see the 36 figure anywhere. Is it, am I missing something? It's, it's, it's in the recommendation and oh, um, it's in the memo. It's in the memo. Oh, it's in the memo. Okay. Right. So I essentially, we've memo. taken the numbers provided by the vendor, added a, a small contingency of $1,500, and have arrived at the 36220 okay. number. Other questions or comments from anybody on the board? Can I? Anybody who else who wants to speak to this? Mr. Montgomery? The hope here, as I understand it, is to come up with a set of recommendations for each building, a plan of these are the measures that we, the committee, with the guidance of this consultant, recommend to the town. Mm -hmm. um, each measure, like for this building, there may be 20 measures recommended. Uh, each measure will have associated with it a cost, because she's, she'll be doing costing with these and uh, amounts saved in dollars and energy. So we can look at the, each measure and the aggregate list of measures and say, this is gonna save the town so much money over so many years. So what this means is by the end of the year, if this goes as planned, we'll be presenting to the select board 
a long list of possible capital expenses that we would like very much for you all to consider incorporating into next year's budget to get this work actually done. And that's what we asked to have done. Yeah, that's exactly, that's what, we, yeah. exactly what we were looking for. Yep. So thank you. Yeah, so th the hope is that when we come up and it's like whatever hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars that the town just doesn't go, whoa, what's this? Right. That, you know, we're... Well, I mean, during that. budget season, you can certainly expect that the board's going to go, we'll do that. whoa, <laughs> when we're asked, no, no, no. We when are we're asked to, to raise off. taxes uh, in order to make these improvements when we've got a lot of other expenses to deal with. And we're going to understand the presentation that will help us save money over time. But whether we can afford to make those improvements in any given budget year is going to involve a ton of issues. Uh, that go just beyond the cost savings in any given year because um, uh, raising taxes is a very difficult thing and there's a lot, a lot of other capital needs that the town um, um, faces and so we'll consider these along with everything else but we absolutely ask for them. Donna? And I would also add to that that it would be a time for the board to hear from the Energy Committee of all of the suggestions made for each location, what might be an appropriate first or second step in terms of maximizing eventual savings. So we will yeah. look to that committee for your recommendation. Understanding the list will be long and may take the town a while to go through that and really act on each of them. We're also, we've, we've <coughs> talked about with, Nuken, with uh, the police fire and other projects as well, and the capital projects, looking at the long term effect on the tax rate of those savings over time so hopefully we'll see that see it presented that way as well because it looks like the taxes are going to go up and in fact if you look at it over a long period of time it's going to be significant savings and that savings should be accrued or should be implemented on day right. one yeah. like as soon as the projects are installed the total cost of the town should drop so we'll see but yeah but thanks well, I think I speak for the Energy Committee when I say the committee is really happy that this project is moving forward. We've been working on this for a while, and we think it it will um, have a, uh, reduce the long-term costs to the town for its energy bills. Um, and it's been really important to have the support of the select board, um, especially setting up the energy efficiency fund that we're going to use um, to do these audits. And um, we especially appreciate Patrick's time and dedication and, and kind of moving it to the next stage. So um, we're very happy and appreciative that uh, we've made it to this point. And as Patrick said, we were unanimous in agreeing that um, Margaret Dillon is very well qualified and I think will work well with the town on this project. What's interesting about your committee is that you're so stealth. I mean, we don't hear about you, then all of a sudden we hear about you, so it's, it's, it's nice that you're, you're kind of still doing it. And, we'll know. try to be a little less stealthy. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. I, I like it. I, just, I think it's great. And you guys are colorful on TV. I it's very colorful on TV. I, I have to that's comment. what I was looking at. You had to admit There we go. Yeah, have a look at yourself. <laughs> See that? Look at that. I'm telling you. Good looking. Well, I'm glad to see that the numbers came in yeah. uh, at the price that they did. Uh, there was a recommendation about two years ago, as I recall, for $3,000, and my response was, that's totally unrealistic if you want to win it. And, and I said, it's totally unrealistic. We need to find a real source of money in order to begin doing the planning work if we're really going to make a commitment to this. And if I recall correctly, we took some money out of the agricultural yeah, loan fund yeah. because that revolving fund had barely been used in many years. Yeah, and, with their blessing. Right. And if we can uh, um, begin on the road towards making these energy improvements, I think it'll be a savings for the town. But we have to recognize it may take time to implement them because there are significant hard costs up front. And, um, uh, there's pressure on the tax rate. But that's in no reflection on 
you people and the work we'll that you do. We'll have to prioritize so. when the time comes. Yeah. So. But and I think it, it will be an important going. job for our committee to prioritize yeah. these projects, as you yeah, said. Help us figure it out. And we thank you for your continued service on that committee. It's a really essential committee to this town. All of them are. But we appreciate your work. Thank you. Is there other comments from the board? Anybody in attendance want to speak to these matters? We're ready for motion. Oh. John's got it. I don't have it. I got there. it. There you go. All right. To authorize the engagement of sustainable energy education demonstration services, SEEDS, to complete energy audits of 14 town facilities and to authorize the town manager to take related actions to ensure successful completion of this project for a total price not to exceed $36,220. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we oppose your abstaining. That carries 4-0. Uh, that's the end of the regular meeting agenda. Thank you, uh, Thanks, thank you Thanks. gentlemen, thank you for much. your work. Um, I need to uh, move that the board enter executive session for less than five minutes <coughs> to discuss probable litigation and contract related matters where premature general public knowledge would put the municipality, people involved, um, and the town at a substantial disadvantage. And I'll just invite the town manager into the session. Um, there will be no dis decisions, no discussions after the executive session. Our regular business meeting is concluded at this point. I want to thank members of the press. I want to thank the ASL interpreters. Thank everybody who's been in attendance and participating in the meeting. Thank everybody who watched us on BT, BCTV. Stay, Good night. Stay cool. So uh, there's.